Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly chess interview show where we talk with accomplished chess players, authors, and personalities about their lives, their careers, and how to improve at chess. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters and by Chessable.com. Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We are privileged to be joined this week by another high-level grandmaster and trainer. He works with amateur adults as well as Strong Youth, the National Youth Chess Academy of the Polish Chess Federation, which may give away that he is joining us from Poland, and he's one of Poland's top players, rated FIDE 2618, has won many tournaments both in Poland and internationally, has been active in the Pro Chess League where he has beaten the likes of Fabiano Caruana, Alexander Grushuk, and others. And of course, he is the author of a brand new book from our friends at Thinkers Publishing. It is called Universal Chess Training. It is quite a unique format as we'll be discussing in moments, but it is uh, quite instructive and I'm eager to dig into the book as well as to this gentleman's career. So without further ado, uh, welcome Wojciech Moranda. Thank you very much for the, uh, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Yeah, I'm excited and I've been uh, reading your book and it's it's a very unique format, as I said. I mean, it's it's essentially a puzzle book, I would say, for reasonably strong players. I, th- I believe you say 1,600 to 2,500, although I, I, I think it might even be stronger than that because right from the beginning, the, the puzzles are challenging, but I love the way they're presented and that they aren't just, tac- just, aren't just tactical and that they're explained very thoroughly. So, so Wojciech, how did you get the idea for, for presenting your book in this manner? Well, first of all, thank you for your kind words. It means a lot to me, especially as any any piece of feedback that I may may get, you know, from from readers and you know, like fans and also uh, other persons. Well, you know, first of all, my main motivation. What was my main motivation to write a book in general? Because this is uh, my first book, my first you know individual book. Um, I simply wanted to, you know, like share high quality training material with the chess populace. Um, you know, like the thing is that there is like a great number of, uh, of, of books available on the market. You know, there are those publishing houses which I rate very, very highly, for example, you know, like Quality Chess, New In Chess, and obviously the, the, like my publishing house, uh, that is, I mean, the, uh, the publishing house under which auspices I'm, I'm currently publishing, that is uh, Thinkers Publishing. But, you know, like, uh, since I'm a player and a coach at the same time, I'm constantly, uh, I've been constantly searching for very good training material, both for myself and, you know, my students. The problem being that um, most of the books are, you know, like, they're written in this way. Uh, I mean, I very often kind of come to the conclusion that uh, I would put something, I would put some things differently. I'd be adding some other examples, or maybe I would be emphasizing, you know, other things in, in the text, right, in the, in the commentary of those people. And you know, as they say in my country, uh, if you want something to be done well, you need to do it yourself. So I came to the conclusion I can, you know, like sit there whining, you know, and saying, <laughs> oh no, uh, I need definitely more quality uh, training material, or I can simply you know, kind of do it myself. And this was my, you know, like main motivation. Again, I want to emphasize that there's like a lot of quality material. And myself, I've been reading, like uh, currently I'm reading, you know, like books from all major publishing houses that there are, you know, on the market. And I'm super satisfied, super happy, you know, those uh, about the books produced by those by those uh, publishing houses that I mentioned. But, you know, one day there, there always comes a time in your life that, you know, you simply have to do something yourself. And this was exactly me uh, back a few months ago. And I'm very happy also wanted to thank my publishing house at this Thinkers Publishing for giving me such an opportunity. Yeah, they're putting out a lot of uh, great books and uh, this is this is no exception. And I'm, I'm glad to hear that you also seem to be keeping up with the literature uh, from uh, other books of Thinkers Publishing as well as other publishing houses. So of course, I'll be asking you about chess books later, but I wanted to dig in a little bit more. I know that you mentioned in the book and it's kind of clear from what you said, you're not looking to uh, to take shots at other authors to, to call anyone out, but do you mind elaborating a little bit about specifically what you felt was uh, missing in the way that material is often presented? Well, you know, there's some, there, there's quite a lot of reasons, right? Uh, first of all, my book contains like 90 original positions that 
um, I try to make sure of that that they're not going to be featured anywhere else. So if you're looking for a bibliography kind of a, a page in my book, you're not going to find one because basically it's this, this book was like a product of something like 400 hours of me searching for examples. Uh, 100 hours is like purely the selection, I would say, because I was interested in top-notch material, right? Uh, you're not gonna find, at least this was my one of my aims, right? Uh, the, the, the reader finds, you know, like original original material, something that is not available uh, elsewhere, right? I, I can ask you, for example, this kind of question, how many times before have you seen you know this example coming from the game Roshevsky Petrosian Zurich 1953 you know this famous rookie six exchange sacrifice oh yeah yeah how many times 20 I'm 30? <laughs> yeah <laughs> I'm probably not not quite as well read as you but I've definitely seen it I would say 10 times and you know like what is really funny uh, most of the authors award this move this move like two exclamation marks and you know like judging by today's standards when everything can be verified uh, with computers uh, you're going to be surprised to learn that this is actually a dubious move this is a dubious move which leads to a position that is very close to losing when you analyze it a little bit you know further beyond right but nonetheless for some strange reason people keep on you know kind of uh, including this example you know in their books right? i mean like okay for somebody who sees this for his first time it can be like a revelation right it's such, right it's such a beautiful example but if you're seeing it like the like for the 20th 30th time right and imagine that the book that you have just purchased is full of such examples what what is the very first thought that comes to your mind I want my money back. I want my money back, right? This is what you're thinking about, right? I, I recently, you know, purchased this book. I'm not going to say from which kind of publishing house. And, you know, like, it's a great book, just, just for the record. But, but you know, I know like 90, 90%, something like 90% of the examples, you know, that were featured therein. So you're thinking like, hey, it's cost me like 30 bucks, right? I got like 10% of novel material, you know, for 30 bucks. What should be the actual price? What should be the actual price? You were, I'm wondering, right? But you know, I know that I'm like a specific person because like I'm like a grandmaster, like 2,600 grandmasters. So you know, there are people out there who aren't you know like as highly rated. I would say who do not have so high, so high expectations. But I'm responsible also for other people, for like my students, for whom I'm on the search for material like literally every day. Every day I'm looking for new material. So for me. It's simply that, you know, I couldn't afford, I wouldn't have a, like a clear conscience if I wrote a book like this, you know, with numerous examples that are, have already been featured in other books in the past. Again, I'm not complaining because, you know, like every single time I see this aforementioned, you know, example, you know, again and again, I always find something new in it. Somehow, I don't know, it's, it's simply so instructive. On the other hand, I would really prefer if, you know, those other books that I purchased, they featured something new, something that I have not seen before. And I mean, it's like watching the very same old New York Knicks match over and over again, I would say, even <laughs> if it's great, even if they won the season thanks to that. Well, uh, you're going to get bored one day with that. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a very good point. And for, for listeners, I encourage listeners to, to call up the position. I'll put it in the show notes. I think it will look familiar to a lot of you. But the basic idea is uh, Petrosian just puts his rook somewhere where it can be captured, uh, losing, sacrificing an exchange in order to get control of a square. And it's interesting to hear that engines don't really approve of it. Um, I wasn't aware of that, although I can't say that it shocks me given uh, the engine's reaction to a lot of the other sort of classics. And what you're saying calls to mind a, a conversation I had with um, correspondence champion John Edwards, who was sort of lamenting the same thing, that a lot of these these classic puzzles are in every book. So, And he's got like, a, you know, thousands and thousands of chess books, an amazing collection. And he was saying when he gets a new book, um, he just looks through it to see which of the positions he knows are in it. He knows it's going to be, he knows it's going to be positions he already knows in it. He's just curious which ones they picked. Exactly. And I'm going to, I'm going to say something more. Imagine, well, you get your hands on a, on a completely new example, right? And, you know, you're eager to solve it. You like it. You see that there is some dynamic potential, let's say, in the position, right? And you, and you find like a solution, which is perfect in your opinion, right? You, you go straight to the solution section. And what you see, it's not only that the solution is different, but it's also, you know, upon further inspection, inspection, like closer inspection, uh, you learn that there is not only like one viable, you know, solution according to the computer, but two, three, four, 
right? I mean, your satisfaction level, at least my satisfaction level, would drop significantly. It would be plummeting if I came to the conclusion that there were like four different solutions and I only thought about one as, you know, as a tangible one. This is also something that I frequently see in those especially older books. I can understand that. But for example, there's one more thing, and it's not, you know, like some kind of... Uh, Accusation, please don't get me wrong again. But I often, you know, kind of uh, see people write books like this. They they title the book like prophylaxis, for example, right? And they include a lot of examples, you know, like 200, 300 examples, right? And you see, like, you're you're contemplating buying the book, and you say, like, yeah, I'm going to do that. It's, it probably offers great value. I'm going to train, you know, for example, prophylaxis out here. But what is the tr real training effect? Of you know like solving examples like that, you, you you take the very first example and you know from the start right that you need to kind of focus on on the possibilities options of the opponent right and then you make an, and then you solve another one another one by the time you you notice that you have solved you know the 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 exercise from the entire book you go to a game like an over the board game and then obviously you keep on thinking in this kind of a manner right but is it really, you know, does it cut the learning curve that he solves such 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 exercises, you know, from the book in, the, in this kind of way, knowing what to pay attention to? In, in the real game, you never know that. You never know that. This is also why, because you ask, like, about the construction of my book, right? And in my book, there are, like, 90 examples, but you're never going to know what the next example is, is about. You're never going to know because they're, like, shuffled. They're, like, you know, spread across the book in a more or less random order. Right, and to my taste, this is also what I do sometimes with my students. I've noticed that if I start like a like, training and I tell them, okay, we're going to be talking about, let's say, hanging pieces today. Right? Let's imagine this. We're going to be talking about hanging pieces. They're going to be looking at those hanging pieces. They're going to be literally digesting those hanging pieces with their eyes. They're going to simply know what to look at immediately. This is why I changed my method. I said I usually now say, okay, the first example is without any hints. Right? I'm not going to say a word. I just want to see you kind of solve it by yourself because to me, this is, you know, this kind of approach that cuts the learning curve. Obviously, you could argue, you could say, well, but the other examples, they already know the topic after the words. Yeah, because I share the ideas. I started explaining to them what this is all about, right? But you, you I, I, I guess you wouldn't be really surprised to learn that, uh, you know, statistically speaking, my students usually fail with the first exercise. Right? But then they go on you know, to solve them splendidly, all the other ones. Right? Is, is, it an, is it a coincidence? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, I try to. I've been in, increasingly in recent times trying to adopt a similar approach. I mean, I'm sure you're you're generally probably working with uh, some stronger students than I am, but I do think it's important not to not to prompt people too much before uh, presenting material. And I, you know, as a as a improver myself, as someone who would still like to get better, I'm always looking for puzzles of that nature. And that's why I appreciated this book. And there were a couple other things I noticed that were different from other books that I just wanted to ask you about. So um, one of them was the fact that, as you say, it's fresh material. It's all almost all games from the past couple of years, but it wasn't just Grandmaster games. I mean, some of them are like FIDE 21, 2200s in the games. So that was one observation that struck me. But even more, uh, what stood out to me even more was so often the puzzles that you presented actually had a solution that wasn't found during the game. Um, which I found interesting. I mean, to me, it doesn't make it any less instructing, but instructive. But how did you come to the decisions to uh, present puzzles chosen that way? Well, it's definitely about uh, you know retaining an adequate level of difficulty. When I say when I write in the book that you know like some exercises, for example, in chapter one, are supposed to be solved you know for the for, by this target group of sixteen hundred to nineteen hundred kind of a player, uh, I do not say that this is like the objective kind of difficulty of the uh, exercises you know given therein. I rather say that it's like. Um, you know, if you rate at least 1600, you have like a passport to enter, right? This is this chapter, I would say. But if you are like 1900 rated and you want to progress, right? This means basically, at least to my taste, that you should be solving, you know, like exercises that are like like at uh, like 20% kind of a higher level than your current level. Right. So those exercises, obviously, are quite quite tough. And here we come into the reason why 
most of the exercises only start when something went terribly south for one of the one of the players. Not 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 often, not not so rarely, you know, like a grandmaster, because it means to me that if a grandmaster faltered, like a person who's got like twenty or thirty years of playing experience, there's probably something very interesting here. There's like a there's like a treasure chest of information hidden out there. Right? So uh, very often when I analyze those moments, I come to the conclusion that there was so much depth out there that I really cannot simply help myself not to talk about, right? not to share this kind of knowledge, maybe even wisdom you know, with, with other people. Right? So, so this is what I do. This is what I do in the book. Right? Uh, there are obviously a few examples you know, that, which feature somebody playing exactly in the perfect way, I would say, in the game, but they're obviously very scarce. Why? Because perfection is a scarce feature, I would say. Right. Um, and so you mentioned you spent, I think you said 400 hours uh, getting this book ready, which is amazing. Uh, by the way, before I ask you this question, I also wanted to highlight the feature that it's unique in that you present the puzzles, but then often with the solution, the solutions are not only very clearly explained, but often you'll show like the next 15 moves or something. It's not just like, oh, here's the tactic and then that's it. You, um, It's almost like a uh, annotated game collection in disguise um, based on the way it's presented, which, which I also enjoyed. Um, so in these 400 hours you spent preparing, was it just going through the games one by one or were you using search shortcuts on chess base? I, I was just curious because, um, because as you say, the positionals are, positions excuse me, are also original. Well, I'm going to put it like this. Uh, basically, if you're like a chess coach, uh, every single day, you really need to visit, you know, like websites like, like let's make it chess bomb, right? Or chess twenty four, or maybe websites which feature like the latest games, you know, in, in the form of databases. Let's make it the weekend chess, for example, website. Right? It's great. It's basically, you know, like a primary source of uh, information on games. You know, just indispensable for just about every every title player. Uh, and you know, like what you do, you tend to, you know, like filter. The material, you know, in the direction of some kind of useful training, training exercises for your for your students, right? So um, obviously, this was like it was sometimes like looking for like a needle in the haystack. However, you know, like after let's make it let's make it ten hours of searching and finding like a gem. I definitely felt you know satisfied. I definitely felt pleased. You know that uh, that you know that I'm doing the work. That maybe some person, some other person is not doing, so that you know some per some other persons in the world can learn more from me. I would say this is also why I tend to comment on those games in a very, mm, very ex uh, extensive, sometimes you could even say a verbose way, right? But why do I do that? Because I wanted to make this book like available, you know, like um, intellectually available for everyone, right? I do not wish to discriminate in the negative, you know, like this is like a very strong word, but. Um, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna say like this. I did not wish to discriminate like 1,600 players uh, just because they are at the beginning of their you know journey towards chess mastery, right? I could obviously write a book you know like uh, aimed at 2,500 players exclusively, and my com comments would also be you know like uh, would also be you know like uh, adequate. I would say that I would be you know, giving you know like two three sentences per move, and this would be just about it because those grandmasters. You know, they know what I mean, right? But if I want to make it a book, you know, for everyone, if I even want to, want to write a book in which the, uh, the most difficult exercises are still very much achievable, if the solutions are very much achievable for, like, you know, for the general chess populace, for the members of the general chess populace, I really need to, you know, start writing. I need, really need to start explaining. It's also my kind of uh, philosophy, you know, like uh, text over variations. For example, there is like this great series of books, uh, My Great Predecessors, right? you know, like Kasparov, you know, all the uh, good masters, masters from the olden days. And again, uh, disclaimer, disclaimer, fantastic. Books, fantastic books. I mean, like uh, uh, probably like uh, the series that I recommend to all of my students, just for them to be able to acquire, you know, chess culture, this widely understood chess culture, right? Just to 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 to, to let it soak in into them, right? But what's the point? Uh, if, have you read the books, by the way? Uh, I've read some of them. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I'm certainly familiar with how they're presented. And what do you think about the length of variations? 
I mean, you know, the knock on those books is that they're so engine driven that it's it's a bit intense. Mm -hmm. How did you? What was your experience? You know, when it goes for analyzing like sideline of a sideline of a sideline. <laughs> uh, my experience, <laughs> my experience was non-existent. <laughs> <laughs> you get my point. No. Yeah, so if, exactly. If, if you kind of skim from my book very quickly, you're gonna uh, immediately understand that I focus on the text. Right? Because then again, there are different types of players. There are some people who, you know, just quickly, you know, take one one look at the variation and know, know, know everything. And there's there are also players who, you know, like need to understand. And when you want to understand, you want to definitely use different kind of learning methods, you know, like reading, uh, kind of thinking about it nearly right, but also, you know, moving the pieces on the chessboard. My book is for everyone. I, I, want, I wanted to make a book, you know, that doesn't really uh, distinguish uh, between, you know, like rating groups, between, you know, strong players and weak players, because, you know, what is, what is, what is very special um, about this book, in my opinion, is that, uh, you know, if you're a great chess thinker, but you're rated like nearly 1600, you still stand a chance of solving all, literally all of the exercises in that book. But if you, even if you're like a 27, 2800 rated grandmaster, and you do not kind of pay attention to the little, to the, the details in the exercises. You may be making mistakes along the way. This was my purpose. This was my goal. One of one of the very kind of uh, objectives that I was following when writing. Cool. Yeah. Well, I I I enjoy it, and I commend you. I've I'm mainly worked on the first section so far, which already, as you, as you say, like I'm you know 21 something fide, and I you know some of them I got right, but not all of them by any means. Well, um, I, I'm sorry for interrupting. Uh, I just wanted to say that um, I might have stretched it a little bit, to be to be honest, just between you and me. <laughs> <laughs> but but you know the funny part is this: uh, a few days ago, like my manager from the uh, from the New York Marshall uh, chess team, right? He wrote, he texted me and he said, "Well, in Poland, you probably have like the strongest 1600s in the world." I guess. <laughs> <laughs> That's very funny. Yeah, but but the way you explain, as you were alluding to, the way you explain the answers, I mean, if I do get it wrong, at least I learn from it. And it's not, for the most part, it's not these feats of superhuman calculation where, like, you know, if you show me, like, uh, Kasparov to Palov or something and ask me to see what Kasparov saw, that's just, you know, you could give me the rest of my life and that's not going to happen. Whereas if it's some sort of positional concept, um, I at least feel like I have a fighting chance. Mm, well, one more thing, if, my, if I may. Basically, uh, some students of mine uh, often complain that um, I give them tough exercises, right? And um, I uh, and they complain that well, I would like to score some points. You know, can you make it easier next time? And I say, sure, no problem. But you know, you cannot really treat you know like a, like an exercise that you failed to solve as a failure. I would say that every exercise that you take up, every exercise that you at least give a try. Basically, it already makes you a better player. Obviously, if you dedicate a little bit of time afterwards to 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 you know to dive into the solution, to actually understand all the intricacies, if you let it sort of sink in, I would say this is also why I recommend to my students to do one exercise per day, like literally merely one exercise from that that book per day. But you know, to do it in a specific way. That is, you know, like to to look at the diagram in the morning. To think about it on, a, on your daily commute, to uh, to think about it when you're having your lunch break, you know, while enjoying your, I don't know, like soya latte, for example. <laughs> Come back home, you know, like when when you're already, you know, like uh, contemplating going to sleep, then you open up the solutions section, and then you can actually kind of dive into it and digest it, and you actually let it sink in. I would say right, and if you train that way with my book, you're going to learn after a while that you will start, you know, looking at just in a completely different manner. This is a guarantee. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, good advice calls to mind my recent interview with uh, Grandmaster Peter Wells and Barry Heimer about maintaining a growth mindset um, and the importance of, uh, you know, just uh, not being too results oriented, whether it be the result of a game or the result of an attempt to uh, solve a puzzle. Um, okay, so I want to talk about some some other stuff, Vojcik, but first let's, uh, next up I want to um, dive into a question from a Patreon supporter of the podcast, but first let's take a break and hear from our friends at Chessable. 
As always, Perpetual Chess is proud to be brought to you in part by Chessable.com. Chessable is a chess learning website that utilizes its move trainer technology to help you learn and remember opening lines, tactical patterns, and end games. It is endorsed by GM Magnus Carlson and features courses from I am John Bartholomew, Sam Shanklin, Wesley So, and so many others. Chessable has over 100,000 members and features hundreds of courses, both for free and for purchase. So if you haven't checked it out yet, please go to chessable.com and take a look around. Back to the interview. Okay, so we are back and we are ready to dive into the Patreon mailbag. For those who are not familiar, I'm guessing most listeners are, but uh, listeners who support the podcast are able to find out the guests in advance and submit questions for them. And this question is from recent Patreon enrollee, Matthias Ploch. So thank you for the support, Matthias. And Matthias actually had two questions, so I'm going to break them up, and we're going to start with this one, which relates to rapid chess, which, as luck would have it, uh, Vojcik is a bit of a rapid specialist. I did mention his strong results in the Pro Chess League. Um, So uh, he asks, he says, before the pandemic, I played a little bit of chess online for fun, but when COVID-19 hit the streets, I've been bitten by the chess bug and play more seriously with the goal to improve Hashtag adult improver my game. I play mainly blitz and rapid online at the moment and want to start playing OTB. That means over the board classical once the pandemic ends. With my goals being improving my game and playing better OTB, is is playing mainly blitz and rapid bad for my chest development because it instills bad habits or more positive because I see a lot of different positions and openings, et cetera? Mm-hmm. Hmm. That's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, surely uh, it makes a lot of sense to sort of expose yourself to all possible time controls. That is, you know, blitz, rapid, and classical. That is like a, this is like an obvious trip. Uh, however, you know, at the same time, mm, you know, like during the pandemic or even when you're trying to, you know, like find opponents online, um, they are going to be willing, you know, in practice to play exclusively blitz and sometimes rapid, I would say, but definitely no classical, right? Uh, for longer games, games, therefore, I would suggest maybe talking to a friend or using the possibility to play against AI. This is quite an, an interesting feature. For example, in the Leeches server, right, there's this uh, possibility not only to play like against artificial, or artificial uh, intelligence, sorry, uh, that is specifically stockfish, as far as I remember. But it's also that you can choose like the difficulty level from one to eight. My students have been using this uh, for the opening print, right? So they kind of set up a specific position that they want to start the position from, like from a specific variation they're working on currently. And they kind of, uh, yeah, then they start, they this way look what kind of uh, problems would be, would, would like an engine be creating for them. Right, and then you know they analyze the games, they they draw some conclusions, right, and this way they become a better player. Like Ben mentioned this previously, that in my book I I do kind of uh, prolonged variations very often, right, uh, but it's exactly this kind of um, it, it, it comes from my students very frequently, uh, quite frequently asking me about this. They say, okay, you provide me with like an opening survey. And the survey ends at move 15, but what comes next, you do not want anymore. Now I say, well, because it's the middle game. But then again, but then again, we need to understand that the middle game is like the like the second part of the, of the opening very often, right? Nowadays, when you learn openings, for example, uh, then you really need to learn the middle game, what are the consequences of the opening for the middle game, but also very often, what kind of an end game will you be typically getting? Obviously, this is, you know, like a, a side note already, but in trying, you know, to, to put together all the thoughts that I have in my head currently and try to, you know, get like an answer that is most extensive. Uh, but just to be on the safe side, you know, like playing Blitz and Rapid is a very fine training method, just for you to know, but only provided that you take the time, you know, afterwards to analyze the game in search of, you know, possible mistakes and, and, and the roots they're on, right? This is super important. Um, most players I know, it was really funny, myself included, they play, you know, like Blitz exclusively for training purposes, right? But if you are an ambitious amateur, and I, I, I assume judging, you know, by the fact that you are, you know, like presenting me with, with this, those questions today, that you are at the very least super ambitious, right? I would personally prefer rapid, you know, in your situation, 
as the quality of your Blitz games, if you are not yet highly rated, if you're not yet a title player, might not be the highest in the beginning. This is what I'm thinking about, you know? Um, one thing, however, what you might want to avoid for sure, right, uh, is a bullet. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, it it's has to be sad. It's addictive. It's, yeah. it's, it's a super sweet feeling to, you know, to like uh, play bullet for two, three hours, or maybe notice that it's like 3 a.m. in the morning. Right? <laughs> and then, you know, then say, I mean, like in the four hours, you need to go to work, something like that. But, you know, like bullet is, uh, is addictive and wrong. Why? Because it sort of uh, flattens your tactical vision, right? It it makes it difficult later on. You know, like let's assume you go to a to an over the board classical tournament. It makes it difficult for you to like look beyond the surface of the position that arises in front of you. It is very difficult for you to look deeper because your mind tends to get adjusted. You know, to to what you see within seconds, right? And obviously, what you see within seconds. It's like a Google search, you know, it just, you know, scratches the surface, I would say, right? So this is why I've been uh, like a huge kind of a, uh, like an enemy, let's say, like a, like a complete opponent of, of playing bullets online. But if you, uh, uh, just, you know, just to you know, summarize, um, you can't hurt yourself by playing blitz and rapid online. This is not going to negatively influence your playing strength in classical games, but just make sure that you analyze those games. And this is how I would put it. Yeah, very good. I I agree for I agree with what you say for what it's worth and what you said about bullet was echoed by Boris Gelfand when I interviewed him recently. So uh you're you're in good company. Um well the funny part is actually that um there are so many very good OTB players in the classical, for example, Fruja, who play bullet all the time, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's that's I asked him about that for that reason. But I mean Mm -hmm. Sorry, sorry. Something that makes my it makes me feel as if my theory was, you know, like uh, going was being sh shot out right out of the window. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm guessing I'm guessing Feruja spends so much time on chess that he can spare a little for bullet, but could could be wrong. Um, um, but in in any event, yeah, most of us are not Feruja, and most of us do not cannot spend as much time as he likely does as a young. Um, you know, uh, star professional. So I think for the rest of us, not only is there the fact that, um, the fast games, um, like blitz and rapid, if you analyze it might be helpful, but there's also an opportunity cost if you have a finite number of hours to spend on chess. So even if you're analyzing the games, it might be helpful, but it still might not be like the highest and best use of your chess time. Well, that, that's actually a thing, you know, like how to uh, divide, you know, like the amount of time that you have at your disposal for, for chess training. It's, it's, it's actually like a, like a very good coincidence that you, that you touched upon this topic because, uh, you know, like with, whenever I start, you know, like cooperation with every single student of mine, I discover there's like an infinite number of training methods, right? But there's one most popular one. Uh, playing online all the time, <laughs> this uh -huh. is number one. And the second one, I would say, like you, they, they get their hands on one book, they read it, and they get, they get another book, and then another book, and then about another book. And when you ask them a question, what have you learned from 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 the, se from the second one, for example, they often say, "Yeah, it was cool. It was cool." You know? <laughs> right. I know that they're so talented that you know their mind sort of absorbs the knowledge from the book like a sponge. But you know, for example, personally, I prefer to do it a little bit differently. So I ident identify you know like like four areas of the game that are you know like the main ones: openings, let's say, uh, strategy, tactics, calculation, and games. Right. And if I if I have something like let's say four hours per day, which I can dedicate, you know, to, 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 uh, to, to work, to my work on chess, what I'm going to do, I'm going to distribute the time equally among those areas of the game, right? Provided, obviously, that I feel that I am equally strong, you know, in those areas, right? What should you do, however, if, um, if, you know, if you feel like much stronger at tactics, but you get, you feel like, like lost like a babe in the woods, you know, in those for strategy, do a weighted average. Right? Instead of like one hour that it being dedicated to tactics, do 45 minutes, for example. And you know, this way you already save up like five, 15 minutes that you can shift to the strategic part. 
I would say. But this is obviously like a like a topic that we could discuss endlessly, endlessly. I know if it was your next question, sorry for interrupting. Oh again. no, I, I was gonna say we we do discuss it endlessly here on this podcast. So uh, I'm glad I'm glad that you that you got to it. Yeah, and uh, and no one of course knows perfectly, but I do think that 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 that's good advice to divide your time. Now, do you think it would be effective, like because it can be? Let's say someone only has an hour a day, which I think is um probably more realistic for most people. And I know for myself, like if I'm only doing an hour a day, I feel like there's kind of a switching cost. If I'm doing like 15 minutes of tactics, 15 minutes of openings, 15 minutes of game analysis, like it's so fast. So do you think it would be reasonable to, to have like um, a different theme each day? Or do you think it's important to kind of hit all the muscle groups of playing chess each day? Well, first of all, I would say that one hour per day is... Um, not that much, to put it very mildly, right? Uh, one hour per day is like sufficient for a grandmaster to retain his uh, his current playing strength, I would say. But I, I often, I, I've heard that from many grandmasters already. Personally, however, I take it as an excuse for laziness, right? To be honest, you know, if you have like one hour per day, I would do it, I would do it, I would do it differently. And you ask me, for example, about the about a universal training program suitable for just about everyone. I would definitely dedicate uh, 15 minutes to, to tactics calculation because tactics is like a is like a sharpened knife for a butcher. You know, imagine you're a butcher, you come in the, in the morning you know, to work and your knives are not sharpened. What do you think? You think, oh, my, my day is not going to be one of the best ones. It's not my day of glory, I would say, right? So if you if you train tactics, you know, like in the beginning, everything goes smoothly afterwards because this is exactly this kind of um, uh, this kind of a skill that so, sort of infiltrates other skills. Because, for example, imagine you're playing a technical endgame, right? Like an endgame in which you are a pawn up, and what do you know? You know that if nothing specific happens, you're going to be one A, right? On the other hand, you also know that your opponent is going to be is going to be, as I often say wiggling right he's going to be trying to do some tricks somewhere some traps right so it's very likely that if you're converting such an such an advantage right it's very often the case that you know the position can at least for a you know split second become super tactical right if you are not warmed up if your if your vision tactical vision is not sharp you uh, you actually risk that you're going to be you know like uh, you're actually going to spoiling uh, going to be spoiling this kind of opportunity right so this is why people often say like chess is 99% tactics which is not true but there is a quantum of truth to that i would say right? this is how i would i would formulate this so 15 minutes to tactics um 30 minutes which translates to 50%, right? To 50% of the training program. In this case, I would be doing it differently. I would be doing like 30 minutes of strategy, then on the very next day, 30 minutes of end games, then on the very next day, 30 minutes of something else. Something that you believe, for example, to be crucial for you for you improving, right? Because every single player is, is different, right? This is, this is quite an uh, interesting thing that, um, Recently, I, out of curiosity, I was checking, you know, like the training regimes of all of my students, right? I have like 20, 25, 30 students currently. And, you know, what I discovered was that every single training regime of every single player of mine, of every student of mine was different, was different. Why is it so? Basically, because every single player is different. There have been some attempts, obviously. I read this book uh, written by, in genius book, by the way, uh, Eric Kislik, probably, applying yeah. in chess, right? And, you know, as much as, you know, like, uh, his book is, you know, knowledge packed. I mean, I could read it as a Bible, right? But basically, the thing is that there was one chapter in which he elaborated on, uh, on you know, like the strengths and the weaknesses of players of, of distinct uh, distant gradient, I would say. So he spoke about 1800s, 2000s, you know, 2200s, grandmasters as well, right? Uh, but what was really it was like a curious experience for me that the moment I finished the chapter, I got the impression that I knew even less than I did in the beginning because I, I it was like, it was like my head was spinning, you know, because right. I was somehow recognizing, you know, like uh, the same mistakes among the very same kind of players. All right, so uh, what I'm going to say is this. I do not like any kind of discussions about, you know, like uh, what are the typical mistakes of 1800s because I believe that every single player is different. I've witnessed in my life, you know, like uh, super strong grandmasters who 
uh, couldn't, you know, like spot uh, their queens falling, you know, in, a, in an otherwise simple position. But I've also seen, you know, like 1600s would be beating me sometimes at calculational exercises, right? So this, this is a given. Every single player is different. In the last 15 minutes, in such a case, I would devote it to something that you like as a reward, right? Because, you know, like uh, humans, are our specific creatures, I would say. We need to sort of reward ourselves every single time, right? For example, you know, if you're giving up smoking, right, at the end of the day, you're so exhausted by thinking about not having another smoke, right, that you have the tendency finally to have an additional cookie, right? So to me, those 15 minutes I would dedicate it as this kind of a fun time. So if it's fun time, let, let it be fun. For example, playing online, but analyzing, analyzing afterwards as well. I, I cannot emphasize it, emphasize it strongly enough. Okay, excellent advice. Yeah, I I I um I think there's a lot that people will learn from that, although I will just lament that I know you say an hour a day isn't enough, but I mean for a lot of uh working people with kids, you know, that's that's kind of the best they can hope for. So um, I'm a father of one as well, you know. <laughs> yeah. but, but I'm going to be honest with you. I devote so much time to um, training for my students uh, and, you know, like um, uh, preparing material for them, you know, like contemplating what I'm supposed to do in order to, uh, you know, enhance the the progress of, of, of them, right? That I I tend to not have enough time, you know, for my own training. Very yeah. It feels a little bit as if you were stranded in the middle of the sea and uh, and had nothing to drink right it's a little bit like this i would say oh, you, you, you get my point yeah you're surrounded I, by chess but you do not have time for your own kind of chess development it's, it, 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 it sounds funny but uh, i've been experiencing this for for quite a lot of time now yeah how old is your kid uh two years old two oh years fun old. there's a boy uh, or girl I, it's a girl. I'm not really sure, you know, because I've been getting questions, uh, even some kind of uh, inquiries as to whether she doesn't want to join a specific club, like a chess club already. But I, I always answer that, you know, for her, whenever I try to speak about chess with her, it's like the perfect lullaby. You know, like whenever I want to put her to sleep, I like, I start like, okay, you know, this IGP structure, the main feature is <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> works like a charm. <laughs> and by the way, I, uh, you're, I mentioned, um, I had tweeted out a picture of uh, the books that, that uh, Dan from Thinkers Publishing sent me, including yours. Thank you, Dan, by the way. Um, and then Camille Plikta, FM Camille Plikta of uh, Chessable fame, who's been on the show, mentioned that he's friendly with you. So I asked him for some some intel on you. And he mentioned that, are you, are you a lawyer as well? Is that correct? Yes. Uh, well, you know, what, what I need to admit, uh, like chess has always been like an addition to life for me and you know in Poland you know we're like a specific country of specific people in the sense that uh, you know we are being born and raised in a way that you should have very good grades at school like through high school you know like at the university so that you get a job right you stay in the job for like 30 years right you get you get kids you get married and then you retire and this is like a definition of successful life and you know for me it's, it's also been like this uh like the main priority was Getting, getting like a grade, like getting higher education. So, you know, I graduated actually from two universities because I studied in Poland and Germany at the same time. Uh, I became an attorney at law, you know, I, I worked at the law office and then even at an, like an international bank. It was, it was great, right? But like one day you simply decide that, you know, like that what do you want to spend your life on? What do you want to do? How, how do you define, you know, like happiness in life? And, you know, I, I came to the conclusion, you know, after months of, of deliberating, right, I came to the conclusion that I want to spend my life simply doing something that I truly enjoy, right? So what I did, I, you know, like opened a chess school. I've met with a very, uh, quite a lot of nice people along the way. I've been happy ever since, but also super busy, you know, <laughs> yeah. also super busy. And, you know, it, it's often that my friends ask me if it's always been like an addition to life, like chess, you know, like, how come? How did this happen that you're like 2600 rated? I mean, like, if you like something, it's like 50% of the success. If you, if nobody needs to force you, you know, to do something, right? If you do it something because you generally enjoy it, whatever it would be, you're going to be successful at that. This is how it works, right? I often hear my parents, you know, like kind of um, uh, say that they remember me, like when I was younger, they would often find me, you know, sleeping with a chess set. Why? Not because I love, you know, just the chess set so much. It's simply that I've been, you know, like 
uh, analyzing, you know, very late in the evening. They would be coming multiple times, you know, just to you know, just me, to prevent me from doing that. But I, I, I had my methods, obviously, the torch, you know, uh, doing this kind of, a, you know, kind of tent, right? And I was reading, continuing reading, analyzing until I, you know, like out of out of the blue went to sleep. Right? So if you like something, whatever you do in life, if you simply like it, you're going to be always successful, I guess. Right? Yeah, that's great advice. Although, unfortunately, with chess, it's also super helpful to start young, at least if you want to become a grandmaster. Um, how old were you when you when you started chess, Vojtic? Well, uh, I was like um, five or six, five or six. But it's a funny story, actually, because uh, I was sort of infected with passion for chess, you know, by my sister, right, who also is a chess player. She's not really active anymore, but but she knows the rule. She she uh, sorry, pardon my 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 language, but she kicks ass. You know, she still does, nice. right? And and the thing is, um, you know, um, there was a story. That um, she was she was in the first grade, which is something like eight years old in our country, and there was some teacher asking about you know like uh, some kind of uh, physical education teacher asking about who wants to join the chess club. And my sister was like, oh, checkers, yeah, great, I'm gonna go there, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a look, right? So so she so when she arrived, she noticed that you know like the pieces were a little bit different than, than she imagined, right? And but she was like, okay, let's give it a try. And this is how she how she stayed like for ten years, and how I got involved, you know. And before I noticed that uh, we were playing, we were already participating in in the very first. Tournament. That's funny. Yeah, when I looked you up on Chess Base, I did see another Miranda from Poland, and I was trying to guess if it was your wife or your sister. So, <laughs> My sister yeah, mystery solved. <laughs> um, but, but you know, this 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 is also quite interesting. You know, like um, there there are so many players. Who, um, who have like a, like a second life, I would say, I would put it like this, who, who play very decent chess, but there are not so many players who like reach 2600 and are good at something else, I would say. Right? For me, you know, it's, um, it, it comes up, it, it came as a surprise, obviously, because you can be good at, you know, like, like a multitude of things. Uh, you have to, you have to, there's something to, you need to sacrifice something. So, for example, you know, when I was younger, obviously, like, my friends would, you know, like, hang out at the, at the football pitch, you know, for long hours, you know, and, and I was, like, studying in the meantime. They were having some parties, and I was, for example, traveling to tournaments, right? So, there's always the price to pay. Uh, there is nothing for free in, in this life, I would say, but if I, in retrospect, I believe that I have, that I have made, like, the perfect choice. I would say, there's just, you know, like, just me, me when I think about it sometimes. Yeah, and I'm guessing similarly, whenever you took the decision to work to become a lawyer and to uh, continue your education beyond university, there was the opportunity cost of spending less time on chess. Um, definitely, definitely. And I can only imagine, you know, how good could I have become if I had devoted myself exclusively uh, to chess back in the days. But, you know, I believe in this, uh, in this thing called the synergy effect. Right, the, the, you know, you know, you can never know how, like a certain certain uh, situation in life, like a certain circumstance, like additional education, for example, how it influences you as a person, or maybe like your second career. I would say so. When I was setting up my business, for example, just like a very simple example, when I was setting up my business, uh, thanks to like legal education, I knew how to do it perfectly. I knew how to circumvent some kind of a uh, legal pitfalls, right? And this way, everything went very smoothly, right? So, you know, like the basic uh, basic advantage of a legal education is that you do not sign anything abruptly, you do not sign anything without reading, right? And, you know, judging by the experiences of my friends, non-lawyers, I think that, that this is already something. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, good advice. Um, okay, so let's hop into the second half of Matthias Plock's question, since we've been talking about your your life, kind of your life decisions and life away from the chessboard, we might as well get to his question about chess in Poland. So Matthias asks, he says, as someone born in Poland 10 days before GM Miranda, but living in Germany, I am two years, since I'm two years old, I would like to know how chess was received in Poland when both when you learn chess and now. Mm -hmm. There's a lot to talk about, you know, in this context. Um, how to start? Maybe, maybe this way. Um, you know, like chess uh, is like a sports discipline has always been respected by people, you know, in Poland, 
right? Uh, lay persons, um, they, they tend to be impressed when hearing that you play chess, assuming, you know, like that such a person seems to be, has to be, simply has to be very intelligent. And, you know, whenever they say something like this, I'm like, okay, whether I should be sharing the, the, the results of the research done by people that has been often published, you know, in chess related sources, or maybe should I let them think like that? Okay, so basically it's, 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 it's like half a joke, but obviously there is something to it, right? But what's the point? Even it's even you know the chess is so such a, such a, such a game to the people you know enjoy so much in, the, in our country and maybe enjoy listening about it. But even politicians like to you know like participate in chess related events. Um, I often often even see like elements of chess you know uh, chess related elements um, that tend to be used in various you know commercials or or businesses as sort of added value. And this is the good part. The bad part, however, is that you know this. Popularity of chess doesn't necessarily translate to you know like the to the increase of funding that you know like those those cash flows that go in direction of chess as a sport. Um, as you probably know, the, the the queen of Polish sports is obviously football, not not light athletics, football, right? Uh, soccer in your country. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and 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 this is where you know all the money goes to. I remember you know like very well from from my early childhood uh, because my mother uh, she was not only my mother but also my manager obviously, and she tried to get some sponsorship from the from the municipalities from the local kind of authorities, and you know like really nobody was interested in in sponsoring like a young I don't know like medal winning chess players. Uh, there was somehow always funds you know available for the. I like local fifth league cares, right? For some strange reason, if if you saw some kind of um, article in the local newspaper being published, you know, on a huge chess success, I know, like European champion, junior championships, I think one, it would be like like a, like a two two on three centimeter square in the corner on the last page of the newspaper. But you know, like the fifth league kickers kickers event. Would be like you know like a whole two pages of the newspaper. Obviously, I'm I'm. It might sound like sour grapes a little bit, but on the other hand, you know, like when you ask those people why do they not want to support you know like chess as a, as a sports discipline, they would only then reveal their true opinion about the game. They would say, mm, you know, the nature of they would put in question the nature of, of chess as, as a sport. They would also emphasize that you know like football is superior because it it kind of attracts so many more spectators. Right, and you know, as much as they are right in a certain sense, in a certain sense we cannot deny this. Um, the fate was chess was simultaneously shared by disciplines such as you know, like judo, karate, archery. You know, even if they had like world or European junior champions among uh, like in the ranks. Right. Um, luckily, things are changing nowadays. You know, uh, with I think that the pandemic actually there's a positive side to the pandemic that is uh, like the main driving force of of this change that I'm talking. About. Um, chess has moved online. There are obviously many, many streaming channels already, many more being created, many events broadcast globally. This is great. Uh, I also personally believe that you know, like Magnus Carlsen is, is doing a great job in popularizing the game. Um, he's not only like a world champion, but actually he's like a true, real ambassador of this game. This is simply awesome, right? And you know, in Poland specifically, we have Jan Krzysztof Duda, right? Who is you know, like really now widely recognizable uh, for for more or less every single country countryman of mine now. Right? Wow, that's and great. This is this is really great, and um, you know, this gives me hope. Actually, the popularity of chess in my country will only be steadily increasing, right? With benefit not only for chess but also you know for the society as such as well. You know. Uh, they say it was Paul Morphy stating, teach, teach children to play chess and you will never have to worry about the future again. And there is something to it. You know, like chess teaches us so many skills that, that, can, that are widely applicable in, in business, for example, right? In politics, like everywhere, you can apply those skills. For example, anticipation, right? Predicting the future, right? Um, there is so much that we can learn from chess. And it's not, I often say, I tell this, I say this to like parents of children that are so eager to, create world champions, you know, in two years, I say, it's probably that your child is not going to become the world champion. Right? I, I know it sounds brutal, but it's rather that if the child, you know, he or she starts working on chess, they, they have already won. They have already won because those skills will definitely be of help elsewhere in other areas of life. 
Yeah, well said. I definitely agree. I mean, especially just the idea to work on something on their own to get better, um, I think is uh, an underestimated skill to to learn at a young age. Um, and it, and like you say, with the online boom and now everyone talking about Queen's Gambit on top of that, um, it will be interesting to see how that filters through to sort of the broader business model of chess because it ultimately comes down to the number of eyeballs on it. You know, it's not like it's not like football slash soccer is being sponsored by corporations out of the kindness of their heart. They do it because they think it's accretive to their bottom line. So if enough people are watching chess, the same would be true of chess. Mm-hmm. I mean, I need to admit I haven't seen the the series so far, and I didn't, I didn't get the time to, to do that. On the other hand, uh, there's so much feedback from my from my lay friends, I would say, from people who do not play chess, and they've been constantly asking me about this. Uh, what can I say? Uh, as far as I can tell by the trailers, it's, it looks really awesome. Right? The the general concept, you know, uh, also as a as, as means of conveying, you know, like the knowledge about the about our, you know, like uh, chess milieu, you know, like to the to the to the wider population. It's it's, it's really awesome. Although honestly speaking, you know, like um, what I what, what what is my fetish in a certain sense is like when chess gets featured, you know, in some kind of a movie, I can't help myself. I have to look at the position. Exactly, you know? yeah. And they did like a great job, you know, in, in, in putting this all in order, you know, making sure that those positions are uh, that those positions are okay. However, what's really interesting, have you paid attention to like the hand movements of the players? Yeah. Right? There are nothing there are nothing, you know, uh, they, they can't be compared to the true movements of you know like any chess player. Because I think that you know throughout the years we we we, we true chess players we become smoother, I would say, right? In our movements. However, there there it's it is a little cringe, but it's like a very, very tiny cringe, you know, compared to, to how happy I am, you know, uh, because of you know like chess becoming so so popular thanks to this program. Yeah, and it's funny because you know, as you say, they had uh, they had Gary Kasparov and Bruce Pandolfini consulting, so that's why the positions are. For, there's one or two mistakes, but for the most part, the positions are um, quite rich, and a chess player can get lost in those alone. They're drawn from famous games in many cases, and the lead actress Anna Taylor Joy apparently has a background in ballet. And she kind of attributed uh, some credit she was given for how she moves the pieces to the training and that as long as, of course, getting con- consultation on that. But I agree with you that I still felt like it, the rhythm wasn't quite right with regard to how they move the pieces. But um, overall, definitely, um, y- you should, if nothing else, so that you have more to say when your friends ask you about it, <laughs> you should watch the show. But uh, it, they did a good job as well. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so one more topic, if you're up for it, Vochik, I wanted to circle back to chess books since you kind of alluded to being a voracious reader who keeps up with, uh, with the literature. So I'm curious to hear about both your favorites of all time and also like any, any recent standout books that you've come across. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, uh, that's a tough one because, uh, like during my kind of a career as a player, I think that I have literally digested like hundreds of those, right? Hundreds of books. Um, but yeah, the, the most memorable ones, maybe. Mm, I very much enjoyed going through the Grandmaster Preparation series, uh, authored by Jacob Ogart, right, uh, from Quality Chess, uh, specifically uh, calculation, positional play, strategic play, and gameplay. Mm, was really interesting. In a certain way, these books shaped like the Grandmaster that I am, that I am nowadays, compared to the one I was before getting my hands on them, right? It's quite interesting because when I was reading them, it started around, you know, 2011 when they first got published. I, I've been a Grandmaster since 2009, as far as I can tell. And, and you know, after reading every single, every single book, I felt changed in a positive way, obviously. I, I felt completely different as if my perspective got modified. Right, so this is something the the, the 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 whole series I definitely can recommend to just about everyone. Whereas positional play is, to my taste, a little bit easier than specifically strategic play. You might want to start 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 out with, with positional play first. Uh, calculation, uh, I believe it's quite difficult. Whereas end game play is definitely for the pros. Right? End game play is definitely. Um, what's really interesting about this book is that. There's this kind of distinction, you know, uh, when it goes for end games. We distinguish between theoretical end games, that is end games, which uh, in which there's like a specific specific method 
in order to achieve a draw or you know like uh, in order to have to win this um and it is known from the beginning till the end how to do that right for example two bishops against a solitary king very simple right uh there are also strategic strategic endgames endgames uh, in which you need to devise a plan. It's like I call it like a like a, like a middle game in the, in the end game. A middle game with reduced material. Right? You need to devise a plan. You need to you need to kind of carry it out. Like right? and only then are you going to score like the full point. And finally, there is something that people do not really talk about. Those are tactical end games. And do not get me wrong. This those are not tactics in the end game, but those are end games. That are governed by you know some kind of a mechanism that you need to understand, which makes the position very dynamic despite reduced material, in which the kings are often going to get themselves under fire, right? And this is what makes those endgames really, really specific, right? Really, really interesting, by the way. Uh, what is quite interesting, like a tendency that I mentioned in my book, is that whenever I you know give some of those endgames specifically selected, you know meticulously selected to my students. They often fail. They do not fail because they are weak players, because they are not, right? They fail because they have never done something like this before, because there are actually no books on this on this subject. This, this is quite interesting. I'm actually contemplating writing something about a book about this in the future, uh, but it's obviously a very tough, a very tough topic. Uh, what's the reason? Because it's very difficult even to categorize this type of thing. But I was, I was, I was saying something else. I actually got lost. I need to tell you in, in my own argumentation. Can you please repeat the the question? Because I've been, mean, you know, doing some kind of side notes in the meantime. The books, right? Uh, what was what was interesting about uh, this end game playbook of Jacob Holger is that it contains examples. Uh, that could be put in those three categories, actually. Oh, theoretical endgames, uh, strategic endgames, tactical endgames, everything, all, all in one, I would say. And this is what I like the most about this book. Uh, what have you been reading recently, though? Hmm. Maybe Beyond Material by... by yeah, Google. that one's been getting rave reviews. Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, deservedly, deservedly. I, I, you know, just between you and me. Again, I mean, I know it's a podcast, and I say just between you and me. <laughs> I want to say something controversial, obviously. Uh, like the game of the, uh, like the book of the year, 2019. Obviously, like game changer, awesome, awesome, fantastic book. But if I were to, you know, kind of, uh, if I were the judge, I'd be paying more attention to, uh, to you know, like the, the the ideas to the to the. Um, quality of the learning material given in the book, my book to go to to be on material definitely. Wow. Definitely. Now let me well, ask yeah. let me ask you just for a sec, Vocha, because we know the Agard books are are high level material. Is beyond material? Is that something that's more accessible for the club level players, say below eighteen hundred, or is that also pretty challenging? Uh, challenging, but pretty, still pretty much accessible for the club club player, I would say. Uh, well, uh, what's, for me, what is interesting, actually, um, that the author's views on the balances that there are in chess, because you need to know in chess, there are like, I call them like three elements. It's like time, material, and activity also comprised of, you know, like a coordination. They kind of battle it out in every single game. Right? You can be up on material, but you can be losing because of the lack of coordination. You may you may have a lot of material, but you may not have the time to use it, for example. And the author's views uh, on on those balances are surprisingly you know, like exactly the same as the ones I have been trying to convey convey to my students, uh, you know, for years now. So one one feeling was like when I got my hands on the book, it's like like a déjà vu kind of feeling. I mean. This is it exactly, like you know, like a revelation, but you, about which you have known already a little bit yourself, right? It was like a very pleasant kind of experience to read this book and you know, like to nod, you know, like in, in acceptance, you know, every single time. Yeah, that hit the spot, basically, right? Oh yeah, that was really, this was really a perfect remark, right? So, to my taste, uh, beyond material from Kuliasevich, the book of the year 2019, and my personal rating. Right, I do not want to discriminate. Game Changer is just also fantastic. Obviously. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I have read Game Changer. I haven't read Beyond Material. I need to, uh, need especially after hearing this recommendation, I definitely need to check it out. Um, so, actually, I thought of one other question that I had um, that had occurred to me from reading your Chess.com page, which is uh, you mentioned that you're you're skilled at trying at training people in blindfold chess. 
And that's something that I know a lot of listeners are interested in improving because visualization is so important to improving chess generally. So uh, what general tips could you share? Well, I can, I can tell you how I did it. Uh, when I was at Baku uh, in the olden days, when I was still a child, I would often go you know, with my parents hiking. And what I used to do before leaving home, I would basically you know, like, try to memorize two games. Let's make it two games, you know, of 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 uh, moderate length. Let's make it like 40, 50 minutes. And what I tried to do, as you know, we, uh, with my parents when I was younger, we, we we used to hike quite a lot. We used to spend like the entire you know holidays in the mountains, right? So what I used to do, I tried to make sure that first I remember them, I, that I remember them by heart. They had to learn them by heart. Right? This is number one. Number two, then uh, I tried to make sure that if somebody names a move, for example, let's make it move 24 that I'm going to be able to immediately recall the specific positions of move 24. Then I tried to do it, you know, to increase the, the, the difficulty a little bit. So I said to myself, okay, what's the structure of white as of move 32? <laughs> where are the bishops standing as of move 40? Where, where are, you know, like how are the rooks placed, uh, you know, like from the left to the right, for example. Right? And only, you know, like when I mastered those skills did I manage to, I think that I managed to learn, you know, how to, how to play blindfold chess uh, properly. Um, what, what does that mean? How, how to handle, you know, like blindfold chess? Um, it's, in my opinion, it's super easy to play blindfold, you know, when you're playing, when you're operating on one board, right? But when you're, st when you're starting to play like a simultaneous exhibition, right, on three boards, let's say, then you really, really need to, really need to make sure that you can handle it, really need to make sure that you have everything, you know, under control. Right. So I use this method that I kind of that I could kind of um, compare to like the, like a scene from the movie Minority Report. I know if you if you know the movie Tom Cruise. I know it, but I haven't seen it. There is a scene in which you know he is kind of operating this interactive blackboard and you know like shuffling between you know pieces of information, right? You know with with his palms, right? And what's the thing? If you want to play good uh, blindfold chess, you definitely need to be able to maintain this picture of you know as many boards that you have uh, that you're playing on at the, at, this, at the present moment, and you need to be able to at any given time be able to recall you know any of them whenever the answer from one of your opponents comes, even in random order. Right? This is super difficult, but the most difficult part for me, especially when the number of boards increases, right, is actually to distinguish, to be able at all times to distinguish between what I have already played and what I am still contemplating, what I'm still thinking about playing. Right? Sometimes I go as far as I kind of assume that I have already played the move, whereas the move has not yet been played. Right? So this, this, is, this is kind of funny. Uh, I had I got many experiences uh, in this area. Also, you know, when it goes for uh, live exhibitions, so I would say my 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 last one featured like a blitz game, blindfolded against an IM. I won, but and I won on time. Basically, this is funny. But uh, the end game was completely insane because it was a four rook end game with four pawns against three on one wing on the king side, and I managed to win this, but to remember where the rooks were placed at the given moment was insanely difficult. Mm -hmm. It was like horror, right? So, so everybody who plays a little bit of blindfold chess is gonna know. Is gonna know why it was why wasn't it the most pleasant of feelings? But uh, luckily, I managed to win, and uh, it's it's always kind of a nice to uh, to be able to play something like this, especially you know like in front of lay people because uh, they treat it as some kind of a superpower, I would say. Whereas this is something that just about anybody in the world, any kind of chess player can learn. So one, plus, one piece of advice uh, from me is, if I manage to, to learn this, everybody can. Well, all right. I want to follow up on that. But first, tell me, um, what's the highest number of blindfold games you've played at once? Uh, well, three, because afterwards it gets really opaque, really murky, right? at, least, at least for me. So I'm definitely not as good as Timur Gareyev. <laughs> uh, definitely not. But, uh, you know, three, 
it's already challenging. I used to do this kind of funny thing back back in the days, you know, at university, that I had like two friends who, you know, in between kind of the lectures, they would, you know, pull out their their little kind of chessboards and they would be playing against me simultaneously just for the case, you know, just for the fun. And obviously, I wasn't looking. I treated it as a as a kind of warm up in between, you know, like lectures just to get my my brain running. Right. Mm-hmm. So it, it was it was like it's nice, nice. But what's the problem? The problem is that after a while. You start feeling fatigue. You start experiencing fatigue. Fatigue. You start kind of feeling dizzy a little bit. At least in my case. Um, so if I do more than three, I will get worn out. I will start feeling worn out very quickly. Mm. Uh, so this is why I didn't do more. Okay. Um, so you're human after all, maybe because to me, even <laughs> even to me, it feels somewhat superhuman. And I have to say, Vojtek, I, I think you're making it sound too easy. I know there's a lot of uh, adult learner chess players who uh, want to improve their visualization. And it's just hard building it sort of from the ground up. I do think it helped you that you learned as a kid. And obviously you put in a ton of work and you've described your obsession with chess, which is, um, you know, which is perhaps the single biggest contributor to anyone who's gonna have success is to have had a period where they're just obsessed with it. But have you had adult students who are kind of starting from scratch when it comes to learning uh, blindfold chess? Yes, yes, uh, they represent quite a significant group of my of my students. Um, what I can tell, what I can say about them is this, right? I'm going to use some examples, right? I'm going to use some examples, obviously in an anonymous way, right? Not to disclose any personal data. Uh, so basically, I have this uh, student from uh, for, from Dresden, Germany, right? Uh, with whom I've been cooperating for quite a while now. Uh, what's the thing? It's quite, it's quite a, a, always like a funny experience, you know, to see like the faces of my 2,500 rated students uh, when I tell them that if they want to become like a grandmaster, if they want to be super strong, they need to train like this guy, you know, from Dresden who's like 1,900 rated. <laughs> because to me, this person is like a role model when it goes for the organization, organization of the training process, for the maximization of, you know, like the training effect. You know, he, he knows what he wants. And this is like a classical feature of an adult improver to my taste, right? Those are people who probably have some kind of full-time day job, right? But they know what they want. They, they treat chess as a, as a kind of an obsession, right? But a positive hobby, like a positive obsession in the sense of a hobby, right? They know what they want, but there's always a problem, you know? The problem is the lack, the, the chronic lack of time. On a clock of time, right? The problem is that such persons, you know, if they were if they were in their day jobs, you know, um, they really need to meet need to make sure that their work, whenever they can devote exactly this kind of hour to chess, that this work is at this time is efficiently spent, right? And this is actually the work. This is actually what the coach is resp- responsible for, right? So I know many adult improvers, right, who have been struggling. Exactly, because you know they even had a little bit more time. Let's assume, right? They they had they had they were in good spirits, you know, when they started out. But you know, due to the lack of guidance, they found it super difficult to to actually progress. It's not I need to emphasize this. It's not because adult improvers, you know, like develop in a slow at a slower pace than children, right? Because for example, in my country, Akiba Rubinstein only learned the game at the age of sixteen. Right? And you know, like later on, at the age of like 30 or even more, he was like the second best player in the world. He had beat that right? when he started at the age of 16. Another example, a player from my country learned to play just at the age of 13. At the age of 20, he's like an iron. Right? It all depends on the you know, like quality of work and also the number of hours. So the uh, Gladwellian rule of 10,000 hours is not enough. It's about 10,000 quality hours, I would say, at the very least. But you know, like what is very important? I, I, I noticed that adult improvers, they do stand a chance of becoming strong title players, actually because compared to children, they already have this kind of a strongly developed intelligence. Right? Intelligence in the, in the sense that they simply know how to work, they simply know how to also organize their life, you know, to set some priorities, also to be able at the same time to become better at chess. And what is quite interesting, children do, do seem to lack this kind of sort of intelligence because for children it's like a it's like a process, you know, you do not even think about it too much. They they analyze a game, they play a game, they they read a book, right? And and it's and simply the, the strength is gonna grow. Like if you start out late, 
in my opinion, you have a bigger chance of excelling quickly in the short term, right? Because you already know how to work. And this is the role of the coach to actually guide such people. I have more uh, adult improvers. I have a, a few, I've been guiding a few improvers from, for example, countries like Denmark or, or Norway. And I can say this, uh, I would like all of my students to work like this, to be so similarly engaged, right? Especially those, those younger prodigies who, you know, they're super talented, but their work ethics sometimes, in some specific cases, and, and at times only, you know, are, are not top notch, I would say. That I sometimes find, you know, like a better language, a common language with, you know, people who are older, because they simply know what they want, and for me, they know what they need to achieve. So even if you're like an adult improver who's been, you know, uh, like a self-taught person, I would really encourage you to, to hire a coach it doesn't have to be me, obviously. I'm not, really, I'm, not advertising my, I'm not advertising my coaching services, but it's rather that you hire a person, maybe a slightly stronger person who has some experience, you know, at coaching for like five, you know, like, or maybe let's make it, I don't know, like 10 sessions, like at, at the most, right? So what are you going to ask this person about? To analyze your games meticulously, to indicate your strengths and weaknesses afterwards, right? To create a customized training program. For you, for yourself, right? To suggest like uh, sources worthy of reading, right? To to share his his methods, his ideas, his approach, you know, on different various stuff, you know, to help you and suggest maybe like a, like an opening repertoire that is going to be suitable for you in accordance, you know, with your style, your talents, right? But finally, also to love, to ask a lot of questions, you know, general questions that have always been bugging you. But you never had, you know, like a grandmaster at arm's reach, you know, to to, to talk to, right? So, um, you know, like five five to ten sessions with with a professional coach, it it's gonna translate to one hundred hours of, you know, like independent research if you are a person who's self taught, right? I know this because my because when I was younger, you know, like I wasn't rich to put it mildly, right? So. I had little or no maybe access you know, to professional coaching services. And I remember you know, like how difficult it was for me to excel, especially compared to, to my peers, my rivals. Right? When I was back in the days when I was a junior player, they were excelling very quickly, whereas I was very often stuck. I was reading book after book after book. I'm describing them basically in, in, my, in my latest work. And what's really interesting, it's not that such persons by working on their own, they're committing a mistake by no means, right? And they're actually gaining the upper hand. And I'm gonna explain why. Because by the time the other persons, the rivals, are gonna stop working with those coaches, uh, they, will, they will have noticed that, uh, that nothing is so easy, that they need to invent their own training methods, that you know, like progress is not coming you know, like offhand anymore, because so far everything has been handed over to them, to them as they see my on a silver plate. Right. Everything has been handed over, everything has been pre-selected, right? They didn't have to do nothing, just to read and, and analyze and play, right? But if you're like, an, for example, like an adult improver and you've been proactively reading books, proactively thinking about such things, you will have noticed that you have already kind of, uh, you know, created some kind of training habits of yours, discovered some things that the other people may have never even thought about. Right, so I'm always like a huge fan of adult improvers. Right, uh, I think that those are that those are people of you know like great perseverance of 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 sheer uh, willpower. I would say as John Wick, right, as John Wick, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the movie, and and basically I'm a huge fan of such people because I can relate. Because I can. Relate. Okay. Um... All right. Well, Vocek, this has been great. Um, is uh, packed with excellent chess advice throughout, and it's nice to to hear a little bit more about your backstory. Um, before we let you call it an evening, do you do you have anything else you wanted to add? Well, I think that uh, only that I can, you know, like so cordially thank you for this opportunity. It's been a great ple pleasure to talk to you, to be here on the on the show. Uh, my my sincere wish is that my remarks although sometimes controversial that they are going to help at least somebody out there that somebody is going to feel enriched by our discussion out here uh if anybody ever has any questions uh you can just as well purchase my book and in the book my email address is given ah so okay <laughs> obviously you can you can search for it on your own if you want to spare some for some bucks but you know i'm going to try my best to to respond in case of some kind of uh, inquiries, questions related, obviously, to the content of 
today's podcast once again. Uh, it's been a great pleasure. Uh, thank you very much. And hopefully, I'm not saying uh, farewell, but I'm saying that maybe in the future, if if, 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 it would, if it would correspond with your willingness, basically, maybe till next time. Yeah, that would be great. And I should mention, by the way, of the book available from Thinkers Publishing, which usually means it's available on Forward Chess in due time. Um, another nice thing that Thinkers Publishing does is they they often have like what they call a teaser or a free preview of the book that you can download. And I know that that's already up online. So listeners, if your interest is peaked, you can check out the preview before you buy the book. But I definitely recommend it. It can keep you busy for a while. And uh, yeah, the uh, the unique material, the, the unique way it's presented is definitely uh, refreshing and educational, as was this conversation. So thank you so much, Vocic. And uh, we'll let you get back to your little one before, uh, before she goes to bed. Thank you very much. <laughs> Special thanks, as always, to my producer, Matthew Passy, and thanks to those who help continue to spread the word about Perpetual Chess, whether it's via a positive review on a podcast platform or telling a friend or however you choose to do it. You can also engage with the Perpetual Chess community. You can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Beneficial1 or join the Perpetual Facebook group and continue the conversation about the latest interview. For now, the Perpetual Chess Instagram page has gone back into retirement, but someday we will break the blockade and start marching up the board again. Last but not least, you can also email me through the podcast website or directly at ben at perpetualchesspod.com. But more than anything, I would like to express my gratitude to those who provide financial support to Perpetual Chess. Most of all, I want to thank Chessable for sponsoring the show and to everyone who kicks in via PayPal or the Perpetual Chess Patreon page to support this community endeavor and allow me to sustain and continue to improve the show. So without further ado, I would like to give special thanks to the following people and entities. They are Chessable.com, Quality Chess Books, The Capital City Chess Club, The Abysmal Depths of Chess Blog, Adapta Interactive Web Designs and Services, Apprentice Twitch Channel, Andrew Alharji, Andrew Bach, Andy Ryerson, Anidi Deer, Austin Clough, Benjamin Porto, Bill Sigler, Kathy Carr, Chad Oliver, the Charlotte Chess Center, the Chess Central's Chess Blog, ChessMood.com, Chris Flanagan, Dan O'Hanlon, Daniel He, Danny Davidson, David Schreiber, Derek Jones, I am Dimitri Schneider, Drake Domingue, I am Eric Rosen, Eric Tam, Ewan Richardson, Faraz Sawaf, Gary Foreman, Glenn Downing, Greg Harfst, I am Greg Shahadi, Gregory Galuk, Guven Manet, James Kennedy, Jen Scream, Jeremy Nielsen, John Jernigan, John Rockefeller, John Cromarty, John MacArthur, Kelly Palmer, Kevin O'Callaghan, King Selt, Lucio Casada Silva, the law offices of Stuart Katz, LilaAnalysis.com for cloud-based Lila engine analysis, Michael Can, FM Michael Oblin, Mike Zalazmi, Mr. Mike Shahadi, the famous Mr. Dodgy, the Nerdnays Twitch channel, Peter Sodi, Play More Chess Academy of the Hamden Chess Club, Reuven Fisher, Robert Karcher, the Seattle Chess Club, Shane Unger, Stephen Kelty, Stephen Martinez, Thomas Stanix, Thomas Tachenko, Todd Bryant of StrongChess.com, Todd Kennedy, the Vintage Patsers, which is a Chess.com improver group, Wayne Beam, William Hogarth, and I would also like to thank Aaron Waffler, Ace Viega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Alex Pejas, FM Andre Tarakov, Dr. Andrew Perry, Barry Hessian, Bill Juniper, Bill Moran, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brett Howard Lynn, Brian Mullis, Brian Tillis, Bruce Scott, Chad Hilton, Dr. Charles Snodgrass, Chris Wayne Scott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Shabri, Chris Lott, Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Zalecki, aka Chess Explained, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Costa Carras, Courtney Fry, Craig Mallon, Daniel Ginsberg, Daniel Naylor, Dave Saylor, David Bleskacek, David Hamblin, David Cramley of Chessable, David Lazarus of LazManChess.com, Dalen Shelton, Dennis Parrish, Dirk Decker, FM, Donnie Ariel, Not I Am Elect, Drake Domingue, Dwayne Edmonds, Ed Daly, Ethan Smith, Hallelujah Cat, Ian Mason, Indrick Ryland, Fide Arbiter, Felipe Melo Pereira, Fox Valley Chess Club, Francis Letart Lavoie, Dr. Frank Tortoris, Frank Zanonis, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Geert Vandervelde, Gene Stewart, 
Gerard Barter, Giovanni Russo, Hans Schutt, Harash Srinivasan, Jacob Kovac, Jacob Turan, Jacques Parry, James Aspinwall, James Benastia, James Moore, Jason Woolham, Jadeep Chakrabarty, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, Yep Hoyland, Jerry Wells, Jim Ratliff, JJ Trinad, Juan Almagor, Dr. John Fallon, John Fernandez, John Fantaine, John Hartman, John Jeffrey, John McMurtry, Jonathan Slater, Jose Rodriguez, Justin Gardner, Jen Shahadi, Joel Rocky, John Thompson, GM Josh Friedel, I am Kare Christensen, WGM Katarina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, Kevin Pryor, Kior Gata of the Lakeshore Chess Club, I am Kostya Kovutsky, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Kyle McAvoy, Larry Ryforth, Laura Boyovsky, Macaulay Peterson, Martin Knudsen, Martin Krug, Matthew Passy, Matthew Tedesco, the Mechanics Institute Chess Club of San Francisco, Michael Allard, Michael Hudson, Miguel Araspidi, Mike Clem, Mitchell Fabian, Nate Solon, Neil Bruce, Negmat Mulajanov, Nicholas Isabel, Olaf Mueller Michaels, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passy Passanen, Paul Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Randy Temple, Ricky Grijalva, uh, Richard Hollenbach, Robert Tichy, Robert Turner, Roy Yearwood, Ryan Berg, the Say Chess YouTube channel, Scott Doherty, Scott McKinnon, Sebastian Finsterwalder, Shane Unger, Stefan Roller, Sven Retiek, WGM Tatia Vabrahamian, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Tom Edsel, Tomas Komanich, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Vishnu Srikumar, William Brock, William Juniper, William Peterson, FM Zhao Cheng of Chess1000.com, and Zhivko Stoyanov. Thanks for listening, everyone. I will catch you guys next week.